like some to share some sad news following the passing of his highness sheikh hamdan bin rashid al maktoum the deputy ruler of dubai and the minister of finance and industry in the uae let us all observe a period of 2 minutes of silence in memory of the departed leader thank you all thank you all okay so um let's start the webinar now um so very good afternoon to all of you who are joining us on behalf of the alnu rehabilitation and welfare association for persons of determination we are streaming live now from dubai and we extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you who is joining us from different parts of the uae from different parts of the region and from all around the world i am deepika gopala rao and i am a speech and language pathologist by training and i currently i am heading the rehabilitation services at alnur today's session which is the seventh in our series uh, of webinars that we've had since the month of august 2020 um is basically titled as the future is now and the role of artificial intelligence uh, internet of things and robotics in the area of assistive technology this session brings together experts from a uh, various fields related to technology we have with us researchers who are working with these advanced technologies who will be discussing these applications um in their particular work and will be sharing the advancements that they have come across to meet the needs of persons of determination um around the uae and around the world so their presentations will basically focus upon um providing us a global perspective a global perspective on the use of such technologies um for pe people of determination that is people with disabilities how is innovation in uae fostered and most importantly the user perspective that means the person with disability and what is his lived experience with regard to these technologies and the role that it plays in easing their life so um before me we move ahead uh, i'd like to share some house rules so that we have a very smooth uh, webinar so i'll just share the screen with you so we can just go over some of the um uh, uh, house rules um uh, just a second
So um, basically, what what are we uh, looking from the audience? We request all of you to treat this as a formal event. Um, the audio and video features of um, all of you would be muted uh, until un unless they have a question to ask. We request the audience to please post their question answers uh, questions in the question answer box and comments or observations or any feedback in the chat box. We'd love to hear from you what you think of uh, the discussion today. Um, the feedback link will be posted at the end of the webinar and uh, it will be available in the chat box. Um, it will also be sent by email to the attendees. And each certificate will be sent to the participants who have registered to their registered uh, email ID uh, upon completion of the feedback. And the e-certificates will reach you by the 5th of April. Um, we also would like to share with all the audience and the panelists that we'll be recording the session for quality purposes, as well as for our own records. Uh, we'll be sending you the recording of the uh, webinar to your registered email. So um, hope um, we, we can go through this very, very smoothly. Now, um, we are extremely, extremely pleased to introduce to you our panelists for today. We have a stellar lineup of researchers and academicians and uh, experts in the field um, whom you are seeing on the screen. Each of our panelists is a person of high eminence who has worked in this field for many, many years, um, who is a pioneer in their respective fields and um, has special expertise, which we are very, very grateful for that they will be sharing with us today. So on the, um, on the screen and in order of the presentations would be, first would be uh, Madam Wafa uh, uh, Hamad bin Suleiman. The second speaker would be Abdullah Al, uh, Al Suri Al Zabi. Then the third speaker would be Dr. Saeed Khalfan Al Dahari. The fourth speaker would be Professor Hassan Awad Al Nashash. The fifth speaker would be Dr. Muhammad Eid. And the sixth speaker who's joining us from the US is Dr. Ayman Elbaz. So welcome to all our esteemed panelists this afternoon. So um, we will start with our first speaker, Madam uh, Wafa. Madam Wafa Hamad bin Suleiman is the Director of Welfare and Rehabilitation Department for People of Determination at the Ministry of Community Development. She has a degree in Bachelors of Special Education from the United Arab Emirates University, and also an honorary doctorate in social responsibility from the International College in London. She has worked as a teaching assistant in the Department of Special Education at the College of Education, UAE University. She's a member and chairperson of 23 committees, groups, and organizations at the local, regional, and international levels. She's responsible for managing a number of magazines related to people of determination. Today, she will be sharing her views on the role new age technologies play and how they have impacted the lives of people of determination and also touch upon the government policies and strategies to support startups to develop such technologies for the benefit of people of determination. Thank you so much, Dr. Madam Wafa, for joining us. Over to you. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الأخوة والأخوات المشاركين في هذا الملتقى السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته قبل أن نبدأ نعزي أنفسنا والوطن والقيادة بفقد كبير ألم بنا صباح هذا اليوم المغفور له بإذن الله تعالى الشيخ حمدان بن راشد المختوم رحمك الله وأحسن مثواك إذ أصبحت عند رب كريم رحيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجع إليه راجع الحضور الكريم أشكر جمعية النور لرعاية وتأهيل أصحاب الهنا على المبادرة في تنظيم هذا اللقاء ودعوتنا للمشاركة فيه مع تثميننا للاختيار الموفق لموضوع الذي يعتبر مهما جدا في المرحلة الحالية من عمر دولتنا حيث نحتفي ونتشارك جميعا في عام الخمسين استعدادا لمؤوية الإمارات ومتطلباتها آخذين بعين الاعتبار احتياجات أصحاب الهنا المتوقعة القادمة في ظل الثورة المعرفية والتطورات التقنية الهائلة التي نمر بها والتي بلا شك ستتطور, ستتطور أكثر فأكثر لتسهيل حياة الجميع وأصحاب الهمم خصوصا أن دعوة المطورين التقنيين والخبراء والشركات الناشئة لهذا اللقاء ستعزز حتما من تعرفهم 
على احتياجات أصحاب الهمم خلال المرحلة المقبلة بالتعاون مع مراكز أصحاب الهمم لبرولة أرضية مشتركة وداعمة لتطلعات هذه الفئة وتوظيف التقنيات الحديثة التي تمكنهم من الاندماج والمشاركة المجتمعية الأخوة والأخوات سعيا لتجسيد أهداف السياسة الوطنية لتمكين أصحاب الهمم الرامية إلى تحقيق المشاركة الفاعلة وتعزيز الفرص المتكافئة تعمل وزارة تنمية المجتمع مع شركائها منذ إطلاق السياسة عام 2017 على تنفيذ مبادرات ضمن ستة محاور مرتبطة من شأنها تمكين أصحاب الهمم من الحصول على حقوقهم التعليمية والصحية والتشغيلية والبيئة المؤهلة وغيرها وسيكون لتكنولوجيا العصر الجديد والذكاء الاصطناعي وكل ما يرتبط بهما أثر حقيقي وسريع في تمكين هذه الفئة في هذه الحقوق وتذليل العقبات التي تواجههم وتجعلهم أكثر قربا من المشاركة الفعلية في مختلف مجالات الحياة لقد أسهم استخدام التكنولوجيا الحديثة في منح أصحاب هنا إمكانية الوصول إلى التعليم سواء من حيث الوصول المادي إلى المرافق أو الوصول إلى المعلومات والتواصل المعرفي مع المحيط التعليمي هذا العالم المعرفي فتح أمامهم فرصا جديدة في العمل باستقلالية لم تكن متوفرة من قبل ومنحهم الحافز والجراءة للعيش الفاعل في المجتمع حيث تتسنى لهم المشاركة وخوض مختلف التجارب مع الآخرين وفي مجالات التأهيل وإعادة التأهيل فتحت التقنيات الحديثة آفاقا رحبة أمام تنمية مهاراتهم الحركية وتقوية العضلات الدقيقة والبارعة اليدوية والتنسيق البصري الحركي وتنمية القدرة على التركيز والتواصل والتفاعل الاجتماعي عبر استخدام تقنيات التواصل المعززة والبديلة والأطراف الصناعية التي تستخدم الكترودات مرتبطة بالجهاز العصبي والتطبيقات الذكية والبرامج التدريبية المستندة لتقنيات الواقع الافتراضي مما ساهم في زيادة فرص اعتمادهم على الذات في تلبية مهارات الحياة اليومية وعزز مقدرتهم على التعبير عن احتياجاتهم أن توظيف التكنولوجيا لخدمة أصحاب الهمم لم يعدوا خياراً أو ترفيهاً بل أصبح ضرورة ملحة لما يتركه من أثر واضح في حياتهم ويسهل لهم سبل العيش والتواصل وهو حق دعت اتفاقية الأمم المتحدة لحقوق الأشخاص ذوي الإعاقة إلى استخدامه ضمن عدة مجالات في مواد مثل التنقل الشخصي والتأهيل وإعادة التأهيل والحصول على المعلومات في التعليم والعمل هذا الدور الذي يكرسه الباحثين والشركات الناشئة في تطوير منتجات وخدمات تقنية تساهم في تسهيل حياة أصحاب الهمم يستحق كل الدعم والتقدير والتحفيز من أجل تركيز الجهود على هذه التقنيات ووضعها ضمن أولوياتها كون فئة أصحاب الهمم تشكل ما يقارب 15% من المجتمعات البشرية وبالتالي فإن تزويدهم بالتقنيات المساعدة سيشكل تمكينا حقيقيا لهم وإعادة تأهيلهم لقدرات تأهيل لقدراتهم ليكونوا أكثر قدرة على الوصول للتعليم والصحة والعمل ومجالات الحياة الثقافية والرياضية والترفيهية ويهيئ لهم العرضية المناسبة للإنتاج والعطاء والمشاركة المجتمعية الفاعلة على قدم المساواة مع بقية أفراد المجتمع شكرا لكم مرة أخرى والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته for your speech. Um, over to our um, next panelist. So our next panelist for, for this afternoon's webinar is Abdullah Al-Suri Al-Zabi. Abdullah holds a master's degree in information communication technology with distinction and bachelor's degree in, in science of information technology with distinction and honors. He heads his own charitable initiative, Yes to My Giving Team, which is aimed at empowering disabled people. He has made sure that his disability wouldn't be the final chapter in his story. He has been a wheelchair user for most of his life after being diagnosed with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a progressive degenerative disorder at the age of six. But rather than be defeated by his condition, he has seen it as another obstacle to be overcome. And he recognizes the potential 
people of determination have. He has fulfilled his ambitions of carving out a professional writing career. He pens articles for the Arabic newspaper Al Roya and has published a book of short stories titled Life is Hope. Through his association, he encourages others to realize their abilities, live independently, and follow their ambitions. He is here today to share his lived experience of how assistive technology has impacted his life and how his experiences have been in using such technology. We look forward to hearing Abdullah's inspirational story. Over to you, Abdullah. Thank you, Deepika. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Wafa. Uh, nice to meet you all, Dr. Ayman, Dr. Mohammed, and Dr. Saeed. Uh, uh, thank you to give me this opportunity to share my personal experience in using uh, assistive technology. Uh, and I hope it will be helpful for all of you. Uh, so, uh, is my, my, my voice is clear? My voice is clear to all. Yes, Abdullah. Yes. Okay, assistive technology has helped me in my life and it is uh, this lived experience uh, that has influenced uh, the subject uh, of my uh, master degree. Uh, it's titled uh, of uh, assistive technology uh, effect on the academic performance of uh, people of disabilities and investigative study in higher education institutions in the UAE. In my perspective, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't share my, uh, my presentation. Please go yes. ahead and share it. <laughs> yes, sorry. No problem. <clears throat> Okay. Just turn it, please. Because the the photos is uh, is cover the presentation. Okay. okay. Uh, in my perspective, uh, assistive technology uh, in simple definition is any uh, equipment and devices or tools. Uh, that assist and uh, and uh, support uh, people with disabilities uh, to perform their uh, daily tasks uh, effectively through emerge uh, through integrating emerge and development technology uh, such as robotics uh, internet of things and artificial intelligence the importance of uh, assistive technology is lies in uh, lies in facilitate people of determination life uh, as uh, assistive technology uh, play important role in different fields uh, such as uh, uh, business uh, and education and healthcare. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, can support people of disabilities uh, to continue uh, in uh, the different things such as uh, they can continue their education. Uh, they can uh, uh, perform their uh, uh, duties and uh, uh, responsibilities in their uh, in their workplace uh, uh, to help them to be more active in the uh, within the community uh, and participate more in the within the community uh, as well as uh, uh, assistive technology as develop and accelerate the tasks of uh, people of determina determination. Uh, for example, uh, it will help them to, uh, in writing, uh, uh, writing, uh, in writing uh, duties or in the, to, to perform their, uh, their uh, homework or uh, for example, uh, doing their presentation, uh, same what I, I am doing uh, right now. Assistive technology impact my life uh, positively in, in home, education, and social activities, and which I would, I would explain in the next slides. Uh, 
I will share first. Uh, uh, it will help me. The uh, malware will share. It helps me to to uh, uh, to transport uh, everywhere. I can move free with, the, and then I can. Uh, then I am using uh, uh, the electric wheelchair, and of course, uh, laptop and uh, uh, mobile devices. Up, uh, a car with hydraulic system and patient lifter, and of course, as uh, Doshin, uh, my uh, uh, the Doshin complication would affect the respiratory system. Uh, I need to use uh, the uh, a ventilator. Uh, the wheelchair I use uh, is the electric wheelchair, uh, which helped me to move free inside uh, the home and the uh, school and the campus campuses. Uh, my electric wheelchair uh, have physical control, which helped me to move my back or my legs. Uh, same you see in my in this photo. This was the wheelchair what that uh, I I am using, uh, which helped me to move my back or my <laughs> my back or my leg legs when I need to take uh, rest and feel comfortable uh, during uh, during my task or uh, during uh, studying. Uh, my electric electric wheelchair also have uh, a Bluetooth chip which connect uh, joystick with any laptop or desktop uh, as a computer mouse. So that help me to use a mouse when I need uh, it urgent. <clears throat> and especially with the uh, now uh, sophisticated wheelchair, we can, they can use uh, and daily tasks such as uh, shopping or uh, tell them to uh, climb uh, and stairs, uh, as we see in these pictures. All of this, it helps uh, contribute to increase uh, people participation in, uh, in social and community within community. <clears throat> The wheelchair is a play important uh, uh, is important for uh, people with disabilities uh, uh, with the physical disabilities. And here we can see the evolution of wheelchair from uh, made it uh, by uh, wood. And this is the future of uh, of the of the wheelchair. And, uh, and now they can integrating the robotics and uh, to help. Uh, people with uh, physical disabilities uh, to uh, to assist them to walk. Uh, this is what uh, which car I use it. It's hydraulic car for wheelchair. Uh, uh, it has a hydraulic uh, system device which helps me to carry my electric wheelchair, so that facilitates transportation uh, to anywhere I want to go, especially for uh, help me to uh, attend uh, the college every day. And here is the another option of wheelchair, uh, of the car, sorry, uh, to uh, take the wheelchair, the seat outside and easy to to, uh, to transfer uh, or wheelchair results inside the car. And the future of transportation uh, for disabled people, uh, it, will, uh, it will be more independence uh, and uh, it has uh, more, uh, it will be more has uh, more technology to access uh, the uh, any uh, uh, cars. Uh, this uh, artificial breathing machine, portable ventilator, which I use, which depends on uh, artificial intelligence to measure the uh, pressure of breathing and uh, other settings. Patient lifter is help me to transfer from the wheelchair and uh, to the bed uh, or uh, bed to chair, as we see in the picture here. And the future of uh, patient lifter is uh, as using as a robotic uh, to carry patient and take uh, take care of patient. 
this technology, this picture from Japan, they're trying to use a robot to killing a patient. The importance of assistive technology in home, especially with the smart home, uh, we can uh, control uh, everything in the home, uh, open door, uh, it, uh, control TV, uh, and uh, uh, open and close lights uh, in the home, uh, This uh, and access to the kitchen. All this uh, technology is uh, support and help people of determination to, to be more uh, active in their life and in the education <clears throat> and in the social activities, uh, uh, the suitable environment of uh, uh, providing assistive technology and uh, accessibility and the campuses is uh, very important for people of determination, especially such as uh, elevator and uh, all devices they need. And uh, through my a master uh, degree topic uh, I, I found in the result uh, of this study, I found that um, uh, it is there is uh, important, uh, it is importantly to, uh, it is important to, for uh, people uh, of determination to have uh, for the education settings to provide, to provide uh, uh, assistive technology center, assistive technology, assistive, te assistive technology, uh, assistive technology uh, uh, services center, uh, and uh, with the specialist uh, staff, uh, which help uh, people of determination to be more, uh, uh, to have opportunity to have uh, equal access to the learning materials, to the curriculum, and uh, uh, be how it will be more uh, enabling to achieve the quality of life uh, uh, of the education settings and improve performance and independence uh, and facilitating their engagement. <clears throat> Here's some example of the uh, assistive technology I have to perform my task every day. Uh, first is uh, keyboard, uh, uh, on screen keyboard in both Windows and Mac uh, system, uh, operating system. Uh, the voice control and uh, uh, in, uh, in phone to, to control uh, all the things on my phone. And uh, using a Bluetooth, same I mentioned before in the wheelchair. Uh, speech and generating devices. Uh, speech to text and uh, text to speech uh, devices uh, and applications uh, such as uh, Dragon and Dragon application. Uh, here there is some video. I don't know uh, if I can uh, if I can uh, show it to you now. There's one minute on the video. Yes, please please share your video. Uh, I share. I I open now or I can share later in the in the chat. Um, what, you, can uh, you can share the video now. It's okay. Okay. Is working? Not yet. No. Not able to see yet, Abdullah. <laughs> Oops. Okay, just a minute. Okay. Uh, this is uh, the control, uh, voice control in the Apple. I give, okay. I show that your example. Now we can see the screen, the YouTube screen. Okay. Uh, is it working now? We, is there sound? Because we can't hear the sound. Go yeah. up, yes. Oh, wait, wait, uh, how to... You'll have to probably... Share the computer sound. Share the computer sound from... Sound. Me. Okay, wait, uh, this... Wait. 
Okay, great. Period. It's now okay. It's a whole new way to do everything you love, period. There is some now. It's fine, Abdullah. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Yes. It's fine. The sound is fine. Yes. Like this. Correct love. 16. Open photos. Scroll up. Show numbers. 13. Click share. 3. Tim. Next field. Let's ride this one today. Thumbs up emoji. Click send. Open maps. Show grid. Long press at 20. Open app switcher. Four. Tap share. Tap Tim. Tap send. Hey, good to see you. Open music, turn up the volume. All right. Okay, this is the uh, example of uh, voice control uh, uh, on Mac and iOS, which uh, helped me to control my mobile and uh, laptop. And there is another feature here about uh, um, uh, accessibility features. Uh, uh, alternate uh, pointer actions. Uh, uh, this uh, video I will share with you on the later on the uh, on the chat because uh, for the time to manage the time, it's fine. It is fine for you. Yes, it's fine. Please go ahead. Uh, okay. Is uh, how uh, I move, uh, how I control the mouse uh, by uh, by my uh, by my face expressions. Here there are some examples of uh, new assistive technology for people with, uh, with disabilities. Uh, they can control their, uh, 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 their devices and their convenience, uh, such as uh, chain joystick control or uh, uh, eye gazing and uh, uh, different uh, uh, other devices. And uh, flipping uh, uh, page turner devices to help them to reading the uh, how to copy a uh, book, uh, book. Here there is one example of a future of assistive technology it is uh, a chip in the tank. It helps uh, to control everything around them. Uh, TV, home application, uh, appliance, uh, home appliance, uh, mobile, uh, wheelchair, uh, and everything of them uh, around them. Uh, by their only the ch chip in their tank, uh, so it will help uh, as which contribute to be more uh, active uh, and independent. And uh, Google Glass, uh, and uh, uh, as we had uh, soon, uh, uh, Apple, it will release uh, a new eyeglasses, which uh, help to uh, bring information from phone to the uh, to to the face. That's all, and thank you to, wow. and I, I hope uh, all uh, is a benefit to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abdullah. That was a fabulous presentation. Okay, thank you. So now let's yes. open it up to yes. the audience. Just, uh, yes, please. Just I'll stop my share files. Sure, sure. Um. Thank you so much for sharing your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll open it up to the audience uh, for any questions. Please put your questions in the question answer chat box. We're waiting for questions for Abdullah. One of the participants says it's awesome, Abdullah. Okay, there are some questions that are coming in. Um, there's a question from uh, Aisha Riaz. How do you use the mouse and the laptop, Abdullah? I think you're muted, Abdullah. You're muted. 
Yes, please. We can't still hear you. Yes. Yeah, yes. So okay. there's a question from one of the audience. Uh, how do you use the mouse and the laptop? Okay, thank you to all uh, uh, nice uh, comments. Uh, and uh, yes, I use the mouse and the, I have two options. Uh, by uh, as uh, a normal mouse, sometimes if I can. And uh, there is a, a Bluetooth to connect mouse by Bluetooth uh, to connect my joystick in my wheelchair as mouse. Uh, the, the second option which I use now is uh, as voice command, uh, sorry, as a face, uh, face expression, such if I, if I uh, blink, blinking my eyes, I can zoom in and outside, uh, zoom out. Or I can click, uh, if I smiling, uh, it will be uh, uh, detect my face expressions to be right click. Uh, and if I uh, just move my nose like that, I can uh, uh, use mouse for the click, uh, left click. I hope it's clear for her, for you how to be yeah, using the mouse. Thank you, Abdullah. Um, Mr. Mohammed Yassin, um, would you like Abdullah to explain again on how he uses the pointers on his laptop? Or um, would, you like, would you like him to explain again? Or is it clear? We'll wait for him to respond. So there's another question for you. Um, how do you feel about using brain computer interfaces, Abdullah? This is a question from... Um, this is a question uh, about how do you feel uh, from Dr. Muhammad Eid, one of our panelists, how do you feel about using brain computer interfaces? Uh, did you mean uh, uh, the uh, face expression? I, I beg your pardon, Abdullah? Uh, did he, know, uh, did he uh, mean the, uh, how to control uh, the laptop from my face, by my face? Brain, brain computer interfaces. Dr. Eid, no. would you like to ask him? Okay. Yes, can you explain more, please? Sure. So what I meant is using, for example, devices like EEG devices that can read the brain activities ah, and yes. directly control your screen yes. or yes. your devices. Yes, I understand. Uh, uh, actually, I never was this technology. I wanted to try it. Uh, but I think it will be helpful for uh, people uh, with disabilities, uh, with who has uh, severe disabilities. Uh, I think it will be helpful for them. Uh, and I hope uh, we can see uh, this technology available here in UAE. And we right. can, uh, it will be affordable for all. Right. Um, there's, um, there's, Dr. Mo there's Mr. Mohammed Yassin who would like you to explain again about how the pointers are used in your laptop. Yeah, so I have a, a Mac, a, a MacBook, uh, which uh, there is uh, uh, features about uh, alternative uh, pointer uh, actions. Uh, I can use it to move by my head, uh, moving my head, or I can using by my uh, face expressions, such as if I blinking my eyes, I can zoom in and zoom out, uh, or uh, if I smiling, I can uh, use it as a right click. And if I just move uh, my nose and there's uh, different actions, uh, I can use it as a uh, left click. Great. Thank you. There's another question about, um, you showed us the YouTube video for Apple products. The question uh, is about whether the similar products are available in the Android market. <clears throat> yes, again, please, the questions. Because uh, I the question. Yeah. Yes. So uh, what you showed us in the video um, were, were basically Apple products. Mm -hmm. so the question is, are similar products available in the Android market? Yeah, for Android, I'm not sure if it's available, uh, but okay. I think uh, this only features uh, uh, produ uh, produced by uh, and launched by uh, Apple uh, last year and the last uh, in iOS 13 only. Okay. Yes. Uh, then there are some other comments for you uh, that you are an inspiration, Abdullah, and that um, the technologies that you've shown are uh, very motivating. Thank and, you. Um, 
Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and uh, we yeah if there are no more questions we would like to thank abdullah for sharing um, his views and his thoughts and his experiences as a user of assistive technology and we look forward to further interaction so abdullah thank you so much thank you very much okay so now next um, so abdullah please stay on the panel and uh, uh, as we proceed to the next speaker our um, yes, next speaker this afternoon is dr saeed khalfan al dihari dr saeed is a veteran of uae technology industry with over 30 years of experience in driving technology adoption in various public sector organizations dr saeed is a futurist a thought leader an author and a well known public speaker he has held many senior positions in committees and organizations of repute mainly He is the founder and former director general of the Emirates Identity Authority. He is a former member of the scientific scientific advisory committee of the UAE Space Agency, and he is a former advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs on Information Technology. Currently, Dr. Saeed is the director of Center for Future Studies at the University of Dubai. He also serves as an adjunct lecturer of public policy, science, and technology at the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government. He is the chairman of the board of Smart World, which is a leading digital solutions provider in the UAE. He is also the president of Digital Engineering Chapter at the UAE Society of Engineers, and he is a board member of the Emirates Safer Internet Society. So here um, we also know that Dr. Saeed is on the advisory board of well-known startups, including Virtual Rehab and O1 Gov. He's also on the advisory board of several universities in the UAE. Uh, he has co-authored a book, The Digital Nation: How the UAE is Building a Future Based on Technology Innovation, which is the first of its kind, which actually chronicles the unique journey of UAE to build a future based on harnessing the disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence and also how innovation is driven in the digital world. Dr. Saeed holds a PhD in biomedical engineering from Drexel University in Philadelphia. His main interest is in researching the impact of emerging technologies on business and society. We are very very fortunate and privileged to have Dr. Saeed address us in this presentation. He will be providing an overall perspective on assistive technology and the role of artificial intelligence in enhancing assistive technologies to make life easier for people with disabilities. Thank you so much Dr. Saeed for joining us today and over to you for your presentation. Great. Um... Thank you, uh, uh, Dipka, uh, for, for this long introduction. Uh, I must say, uh, I was really touched, touched by, the, by the talk and the presentation of, of Abdullah. I think uh, Abdullah, today, he showed us a demo of what we are about to speak uh, in this panel. Uh, and this is like a real, uh, a real life uh, uh, demo. Uh, before I start, let me just thank you very much, Dr. Said. Name myself, so I'm running my uh, stopwatch for the 15 minutes. And before I start and share my presentation, let me just uh, put my slide here. Okay. Uh, can you see the presentation on the screen? Okay, great. Uh, let me first take this um, moment to um, really give my condolence. to Al Maktoum family and to His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum for the demise of His Highness uh, Sheikh Hamdan bin Rashid Al Maktoum, uh, the deputy, um, uh, the, the deputy of, um, ruler of Dubai and the minister of finance. Uh, it's a sad demise and we may ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him peace and, and you know, and be peace, uh, rest on his soul. Okay, so, um, I'm going uh, to speak today about how AI is improving um, assistive technologies um, for people of uh, determination. Um, this picture that you see on the screen here is from the, um, the Special Olympics World Games that was in Abu Dhabi uh, two years ago, where I was really fortunate to give the awards uh, to winners, to, the, to some winners, uh, you know, uh, in the games. 
and and to witness really the the capability and 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 the, and the potential of 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 people with determination so um, in this talk i'm going to give an overall perspective like you said Divka, for how artificial intelligence and robotics uh, are improving assistive technologies and opening up um, a world of um, uh, possibilities and accessibilities for people of determination. I will also highlight the UAE effort as a leading country uh, in the region to enable people of determination. And uh, finally, we'll provide some recommendations uh, to move forward and accelerate for how to accelerate AI innovation in, in, in assistive uh, technologies. Uh, let me just move my mouse. Okay, so we know that assistive technology, the definition of assistive technology is a product that maintain or improve an individual, individual's functioning uh, and independence, thereby promoting their well-being. And like we saw from uh, Abdullah's talk, there is a huge benefit benefits for assistive technology. They improve the health and well-being of, of, of people of determination. Uh, they provide them independence, uh, you know, to do things on their own. And more, you know, they give them inclusivity to be inclusive, more inclusive in the society. And this helps uh, achieving uh, the sustainable development uh, goals of the United Nations. And also another important thing is that they reduce support services and 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 care uh, and caregivers. Uh, uh, why we call them people of determination? I think the UAE has chosen this uh, name uh, uh, as a term designed to recognize their bravery and courage in the face of adversity uh, in the face of adversity and we see and we saw today mashallah how abdullah was you know giving a presentation and you know uh, uh, talking to us uh, in in a way that we all understand and communicate with us so uh, also um, uh, companies such as uh, i mean we look into assistive technology or, or disability really as a source of uh, of innovation uh, companies such as Google, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon have started to look at disability as a source of innovation and entirely a new market opportunities uh, in making their products and in, 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 in innately inclusive. Uh, so, so, and also I, I must remind you that uh, you might be surprised to know uh, that the telephone, uh, which is invented by Alexander Graham Bell, was a result of his work with the deaf community. Uh, Bill's mother was deaf. So, you know, those innovation that we enjoy today, this smartphone is, imagine, is the result of a person who started to work uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with the deaf uh, community. Uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, there is today more than 1 billion people, like uh, uh, Ms. Amal has said, 15% of the world population live with disability. And imagine only one in 10 people of the 1 billion people uh, need have access to assistive products. So this is really a big challenge. One in 10 people only can, can have access can have access to this technology. Imagine if all, or maybe 50% or 70% of those have access, we will be seeing more of people like Abdullah, you know, inclusive in the society. By 2050 more, there will be 2 billion people would benefit from assistive technology, yet only 90% will not have access. I think we have to be really very innovative and think wisely how we can bring access. The most important thing is the technology is there. We have done so much, so much work in terms of improving the technology. And definitely we will see that the technology is improving. But the main challenge is, of course, providing access you know, to people in need. By 2023, people with disability employed will triple due to artificial intelligence and emerging technologies, reducing barriers to access, according to Gartner. 
and uh, an AI, artificial intelligence integrated assistive technology is going to generate around 26 billion by 2024 as per the World Bank. Uh, as per the World Bank. So we see there is a huge market you know, for this technology to develop. And we see that a huge potential for AI to play a big role in improving the technology. I'm going to speak up, give some examples about the use of the of AI and robotics in the three areas. One in communication, second in mobility, and third in cognition. So in communication, we know that there is disabled people with, you know, people with hearing problems or with visual impairment or with a speech and language disabilities. So AI improve accessibility and communication. AI in terms of using machine learning and natural language processing as probably we'll hear in, uh, you know, in the next talk or the, after that from Dr. Mohammed Eid and from, from Dr. Hassan and from Dr. Ayman, the use of machine learning and natural language processing, you know, provide uh, for, for example, for captioning, you know, for people with hearing problems. So we can re provide real time captioning from voice to text. And we have many examples here from Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Translator app or Google Translator or YouTube, YouTube tra or YouTube. Now they come with captioning. So people with, 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 with for example, blind people or, or with, 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 with visual impairment, they can, I mean, uh, sorry, pe people with the hearing problems, they can see the captions either as we also conducting, you know, web conferencing, for example, uh, or video conferencing uh, using, uh, uh, using the Teams. So uh, we see several examples of, for example, Microsoft, they also added a, an add-in for the Microsoft presentation translator. So if someone is presenting using the PowerPoint, the captions can be captured and provided, you know, to, 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 the, to, to, to the blind people. Microsoft Office 365, in terms of dictation, people now can talk, you know, and you know that that will convert from voice to text. Uh, uh, but there are still some issues, uh, for example, how the computer or how AI can differentiate between I, the letter I versus I. So we need context, you know, a context analysis for the AI to be able to differentiate and negotiate between this. Uh, AI for automatic sign language interpretation. This is another area where we see AI is playing a big role. Google AI, uh, there are several apps that came out, uh, uh, you know, uh, that can translate vice versa from sign language, American sign language or another sign language to voice or text or vice versa from voice and text converting to uh, a sign language. Uh, a good example here uh, I really want to talk about is from the Ministry of Health uh, uh, and the Prevention here in the UAE. Uh, they worked in collaboration with the AI office uh, uh, to provide a, a smart app uh, for the for for people with the you know with the t determination. So when they visit the doctor the doctors can communicate with them using, using this smart app. So it converts between both, between sign language to voice and between voice to sign language so people can, can be in communication. Uh, so these, these technologies are using computer vision uh, and, and, and the using recursive convolution, uh, uh, re reinforced convolution neural uh, net, uh, networks. We've seen the technology now in virtual assistants, uh, chatbots, uh, Alexa, Google Assistant, Siri, Cortana, that provide really a, a world of accessibility to people of, the, of, of, of determination. And we've seen also some other apps that can translate the world around us and can describe the world around us and can convey it to people with this with determination. There are major initiatives. We see big companies, for example, Microsoft AI for Accessibility Grant, a grant that is uh, launched by Microsoft around 25 million US dollar to help a startup develop solutions based on AI for people with determination. Google AI Impact Challenge is another uh, as, 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 as another initiative also helping startups to come up with innovative solutions for people with determination. And of course, there is Intel 
AI for good as well. You know, these are all initiatives that came from, you know, big and, and companies to, uh, to help startups to develop solutions for people with, 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 with the determination. Uh, AI and mobility, whether it's visual impairment or motor control, helping people with independent mobility. Uh, for example, uh, AI enabled wheelchair. We saw like Abdullah, how he can control things from his facial expression. So now you can control the wheelchair from, uh, from, from facial expression. This uh, Who Books is a Brazilian startup uh, uh, developed uh, a wheelchair that can be controlled through facial expression. We still need to see autonomous wheelchair, fully autonomous wheelchairs coming uh, in the market. And I think it's a matter of time as we're working on, you know, autonomous autonomous cars and self-driving car, we will definitely see autonomous wheelchairs coming in the market. We are also looking at AI enabled exoskeleton, you know, exoskeleton that help people wearing those exoskeleton that help people to move. So probably in the future, you know, this will give a big leverage, you know, for people who rely on the wheelchair. They will be able to wear this exoskeleton and move and walk, you know, around uh, freely. Uh, smart glasses. We see development in smart glasses. Oxford, for example, there is a, 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 a spin-off from Oxford University who developed a smart glasses for people who have a problem with the central vision. So if they have a problem with the central vision, they can wear this onyx called the smart glasses and it can it can really provide them with, uh, with, with vision. Uh, we've talked about brain-computer interface as Dr. Muhammad has asked a while ago to Abdullah, and we see, we see now gadgets and, 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 and interfaces that can be weird in the brain or that can put on the scalp and we can communicate with the world around us. Uh, I remember I did when I was doing my master's degree in George Washington University, this was in 1988. I wrote a paper to my advisor about com brain computer interface at that time for people with multiple sclerosis, how they, they can control things by their brain signals, by the EEG, and then take it. And machine learning here plays a big role in terms of classifying those signals and you know, uh, helping uh, translating those signals into command. Uh, we again with smart homes. We see a lot IoT and AI is going to bring a lot of innovation and uh, in, in, in this area here. Uh, again, in learning disabilities and developmental disabilities, there is imagine there is one in every 160 children globally has uh, autism spectrum disorder. So AI plays an important role here, and I think Dr. Ayman today is going to speak about the early detection. Of, 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 of autism using machine learning, and then so we can have a better treatment when, when, we, when we diagnose people at, 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 such, uh, you know, at such an early age. Uh, and we see robotics that help autistic children to build you know, social skills. There are different examples uh, as well here. I think I'm in short of time. I need to finish the presentation, but you know, I wanna focus here really on what the UAE really is, is, is doing uh, uh, and, in, in, in terms uh, uh, for, for people of what determination. Uh, we have around uh, 25,590 total people of determination in the UAE as per the third quarter of 2020. 14,000 something are national and 11,300 are, are resident. Only 7% of people with determination in UAE citizens have jobs. Imagine 93% have no jobs. So, and our leadership in the country here is really looking for more inclusivity for people of determination to, you know, to, 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 to be in, in mixed and, and, and in the society. So we have the national policy to empower people of determination, which was launched in 2017, which protects and empower people of determination. We give them a priority in services and health, and we established laws for the people of determination. We have a department of special education under the Ministry of Education, which also developed a digital platform for people with determination. Again, we have a universal code for design in terms of the city for people to move in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi, and also easy access to information standard as per the W3 consortium, you know, for people to be able to use the computer either through sound or, you know, through, through vision and so forth. 
Uh, and we support also international startup to locate to UAE. In 2019, uh, Ma'an, an initiative from the Department from the Com Department of Community Development in Abu Dhabi, has launched a two million has uh, launched a two million dirhams fund for startups to work on you know social impact to work on things like this. And this is an annual an annual fund that comes two million dirhams from Ma'an with Hub 71 in Abu Dhabi, and we saw companies such as. Uh, 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 such as uh, uh, this one, Key to Enable, which has which a Brazilian, a Brazilian-based startup who came to Abu Dhabi and offering solution such as the KeyX and a, a, a user-friendly keypad for people of determination, and also a BlindX, another way where they can control through the blinking of the eye and the facial expression to control things. Uh, uh, finally, what the future holds for 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 uh, AI and assistive technology? I think early detection is important, uh, as we you know to uh, using the wearables. You see, for example, you can classify through the early in 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 in, in the babies if if they are going to be have some developmental issues by putting wearables on the babies, and the AI can monitor their movement you know day long movement to classify limb movement pattern and this can be an indicative of of some uh, you know developmental disability again we're talking about autonomous wheelchair wheelchairs and exoskeleton and ai and detection of pregnancy risk i want to ask now instead of doing this uh, uh, um, uh, 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 i mean uh, uh, d detection can we really do have an, a, pro, a, a proactive approach to prevent disability in the future? I think it's an important question. Rather than having you know, the disabled come in life and then we try to provide the equipment, no, we need to prevent this from happening. So I think today AI and probably genetic or gene therapy will be able in the future to prevent you know, disabilities. And, and you look into this, uh, a pregnancy risk, for example, using AI in detection of a pregnancy risk for preterm birth. Every year in the US, around 400,000 babies are born prematurely before the week 37. And those 400,000 are very susceptible to developmental uh, disability. So I think we need to, and, and finally, uh, I, I have to finish my presentation and I'm sorry I exceeded my time by three minutes. What we need is that we need really to resolve the challenge of access to the technology. It's, 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 we have to think creatively. I think we need to have some probably uh, 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 crowdsource, uh, uh, crowdfunding and things like this where we can really bring the technology to the people. Uh, there is also issue of fairness, the uh, AI bias and disability rights and ethics. I think we need to bring the diversity in terms of, you know, and machine learning where we train, you know, the machine learning algorithm, you know, cons taking into consideration people, people with this, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the uh, of determination. We need also to have more impact fund, funds to accelerate AI innovation for people of determination uh, and also a global challenge to develop intelligent solution for people. We have wonderful universe, universities here in the UAE, and we need to make challenges for those universities to come up with solutions for people with, with determination and also to give rewards to those who work on research. And finally, uh, I think we, we need to establish an, an institute or maybe a center of excellence for research and development in assistive technology. I think UAE can lead. UAE has proven to be a leader globally, I mean, regionally and globally, you know, through Mohammed Bar Rashid, uh, city of uh, humanitarian city, and also through the initiative of His Highness, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed uh, Al Nahyan in establishing Mohammed bin Zayed Univers uh, AI University. Okay, so I think if we, focus really in building a center of excellence for R&D and assistive technology, UAE will be leading globally in this, in the, in, in, in this thing. I'm sorry I took too long, five minutes more, uh, but, uh, and I don't want to take more time, but if there is any question I can answer, I'll be more happy to answer, or otherwise we can leave it until later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Saeed, for that passionate and wonderful summary of the scene in UAE and the way uh, forward for us. There is one question in the question answer box that I'd just like to read out. 
Um, Dr. Said, thank you for your amazing insights into various artificial intelligence driven initiatives supporting and assisting people of determination. The question is, does UAE have a research and academic base in order to support such initiatives and have the local resources build solutions in collaboration with academia? Very good question. Yes. Uh, I think, yes, in terms of research, we have research going on. That's why we have those faculty people here joining us today from New York University, Dr. Mohammed Eid, Dr. Hassan Nashash, also from uh, American University in Sharjah, head of bioengineering. And there are many others who is doing bioengineering and biomedical research. But in terms of probably having a center of excellence, for people of, of, of determination or focused research for people of determination. I think this is my, my recommendation and I'm gonna follow up this recommendation with the leadership. Hopefully one day we will have this center of excellence in the country. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the next question is about can expatriates participate in research in the UAE? Definitely, definitely. Expats are welcome. Uh, they can engage in many ways. They can engage with local um, uh, professors at the university and, 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 and the team of research. Uh, we, we, we welcome any kind of uh, uh, participation from the, from the outside world. We believe, and we saw now yesterday, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid, we we, when he has announced the virtual visa for people to come to the UAE, you know, and do their remote work wherever their, their countries and wherever their work is, they can come and establish in the UAE and do, and, and do their work. So yes, definitely, we welcome participation from expat and research. Another question, what role does quantum computers play in artificial intelligence? It's going to play a huge role. We are at the beginning of this revolution. Yes, there are some you know, research facilities for quantum computing, but when, when this becomes commercial, I think it's going to speed up the, you know, uh, AI in many ways because AI is really very intensive. It requires a lot of computations. And now we run you know, uh, you know, uh, AI machine learning on some dedicated servers with the GPUs and so, but when quantum, when, when quantum computing, I think it's going to leapfrog in terms of, 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 of the number and in terms of what we can do with AI. Uh, and we are really very optimistic, you know, uh, within the next, I don't know, maybe five years, if I am very optimistic, we will see quantum computing playing a big role, you know, uh, and, and, and AI will be, you know, uh, accelerated really through quantum computing. Okay. Um, the questions further for you, uh, especially there's one from Mauritius, which is in the chat box, so you might want to look at that. Um, and uh, there is a comment for you from Mr. Naveed, Naveed Said, who asked you the question about the academic and research base. He says right. he's looking forward to bringing some of the European and Scandinavian research and academic endeavors and share with the UAE institutions. Very welcome. And I, and, and I say that we provide a lot of incentives for the startups to come either to Abu Dhabi Hub 71 or to anywhere in the UAE, if there is a niche company which have really a niche solution, you know, for people with disability, they are more than welcome to come and I'll be more than happy really to take those companies, you know, and, 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 and have them established here in the UAE. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking all the questions and Dr. Said, if you can just check on the chat box about an offer for collaboration from Mauritius. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Said, for that insightful presentation. Over to our fourth speaker. Uh, our fourth speaker this afternoon is Professor Hassan Awad Al Nashash. Professor Hassan is a professor and former director of the Biomedical Engineering Graduate Program at the American University of Sharjah. The main themes of Professor Hassan's research are in the areas of neuroengineering, signal processing, and microelectronics. His research interests are in brain computer interface, cognitive vigilance assessment and enhancement, brain source localization, assessment of spinal cord and brain injuries, flexible implantable electrodes, and low power electronic devices. In addition, he has designed and developed several electronic instruments to measure various biodynamic parameters. He is the author of more than 100 journal and conference papers six book chapters, and two U.S. patents. 
He has led the efforts to establish the biosciences and bioengineering academic programs and the research programs at the American University of Sharjah. Dr. Hassan has played an active role in organizing several biomedical and electrical engineering conferences. He has worked closely and collaborated with several engineer, biomedical engineering departments and hospitals at the National University of Singapore, Johns Hopkins University, Rashid Hospital, American Hospital of Dubai, and Khalifa Hospital. Today, Dr. Hassan will share with us his expertise in nervous system augmentation. Over to you for your cutting edge presentation, Dr. Hassan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Devika, and uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening to everybody, wherever you are. Let me share the screen. <clears throat> Please let me know that you see it. We can you see, see it. That? You see we it, it's clear, yes. right? Okay. Yes. Well, um, uh, nervous system augmentation is such a, a, an interesting field, uh, and yet, of course, it's very challenging field. And uh, the, the, the spectrum of nervous system augmentation uh, benefits people, of course, of, 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 of determination, in addition to people who wish to have more enhanced capabilities. Like uh, on the right side of the slide here, uh, it covers replacement like limb uh, prosthetics or cochlear implants, or maybe uh, used for restoration, like in the case of muscle stimulation. And on the other spectrum, it goes into enhancement, like uh, um, uh, vigilance enhancement or, 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 or memory uh, uh, chips uh, uh, implantations. So the spectrum uh, is wide. We at the American University of Sharjah have established this neuroengineering research group. Um, uh, the members of this research group are professors, postdocs, students who come from all over the world to actually work and investigate various technologies that can be used for uh, in, the, in the field of neuro um, engineering. Um, the projects that we are involved in actually, uh, they lie into three main categories. The, the green category is just for the assessment, like spinal cord injuries or, or brain injuries. The second category is for therapy, and, and the third category, which is in blue, for enhancement, with, with mainly focusing now on vigilance enhancement and sometimes also on, 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 on stress mitigation. In the brain injury project, um, as you know, 44% uh, of patients who suffer from cardiac arrest, they end up with uh, uh, severe neurological um, uh, or, 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 or a drop in neurological outcome, which may lead to uh, a coma or, or vegetative state that leads to uh, 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 the, the, the need for uh, a quantitative uh, method to replace the, 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 the subjective methods for assessing the level of injury. We have actually worked uh, with uh, uh, our collaborators on this project and used the animal model uh, where we observed that following injury, there are some interesting uh, uh, spiky signals that uh, uh, are representative of the, of the level of injury. For example, if you have a, a sporadic uh, spikes, that's a, a, an indication of severe injury, while if you have more of burst, uh, uh, burst signal or more random signal like the EEG signal, that's an indication of uh, um, a good recovery, neurological recovery. So we developed some um, mathematical algorithms which rely on using uh, entropy measures for assessing the level of injury. And we have tested this on an animal model uh, with three minutes of asphyxia, five minutes and seven minutes. And you can see on the slides here on the left side of the slide, you see results obtained with the three minutes asphyxia uh, where the animal uh, entropy level has recovered uh, immediately following resuscitation in comparison with the slide on the right that shows 
a, a, a severe drop in, in, in entropy. We have actually compared our, um, uh, our entropy measures with, with some data that was obtained also in hospital from, from a real clinical uh, uh, case. And uh, to our surprise also, good surprise, of course, that our uh, algorithm has been uh, very effective. And this actually got a US patent for, for this finding. The second project that uh, we are involved in and still is very, very active project, uh, that's the assessment of spinal cord injury. And, you know, uh, medical doctors, surgeons, they say even a small number of spared fibers, if we are able to actually uh, check their quality, uh, may provide a, a, a hope for, for those injured uh, subjects. Unfortunately, the techniques used uh, now are mainly subjective techniques that rely on the expertise of medical doctors. So here we are after developing a more objective method that, that measures the level of spinal cord injury. And the technique that we are using, which is based, uh, of course, on well-established method, which is the somatosensory evoked potentials. Here we tested uh, our uh, the, our or our method on animal model as well, where we stimulate the limbs, uh, uh, electrical stimulation, and record the uh, SAP from the scalp region. And then we compare these SAPs uh, from the fore limbs and the hind limbs before and after uh, injury. And uh, various techniques, various mathematical methods uh, are used uh, in order to to make uh, a quantitative assessment. And here we're, we're showing uh, spectral coherence uh, features that are usually used with machine learning to decide whether uh, injury is like severe or very severe or mild injury. Like in the case of the blue here, bars is like mild injury in comparison with the brown uh, re uh, reflecting severe uh, spinal cord injury. And of course, in the baseline, the three bars right at the beginning are those for uh, 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 coherence uh, before the injury. The other assessment uh, project that we're involved in is the for brain source localization, especially with, uh, uh, with epileptic uh, uh, patients. And this is in collaboration with Rashid uh, Hospital. Here, as you know, 30% of, of patients may, may be drug resistance. This is why sometimes surgery is necessary. But the challenge for surgeons is to localize the, the source of the epilepsy. And this is where we come as engineers, uh, where we use um, what we call the inverse problem, where we record EEG signals from the, the, the head of the patient and use this information to solve a mathematical problem to localize the uh, source of the epilepsy. Uh, this, this project was very successful, and, and we have actually just published an article uh, in this March uh, with using uh, the, 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 our uh, uh, proposed techniques. Now we turn into therapy, and to therapy, uh, we are interested in uh, peripheral nerve injury. Uh, and here we are interested in two things, one uh, interfacing with the neuron uh, with the, with the with the nerves and uh, as you know interfacing with the nerves is not an a trivial task because uh, most of the available electrodes are usually metal type of electrodes that can cause injury or maybe not biocompatible etc and uh, the challenge for us was to develop a more flexible biocompatible uh, uh, electrodes and uh, based on the, uh, uh, this is of course a slide that shows some of the available technologies that are in the market. Uh, here we have developed uh, uh, an electrode that is uh, polymer based and uh, uses some sort of like uh, materials like titanium oxide and glycerols to uh, develop uh, an electrode that has similar uh, capabilities of, of metal electrode, yet it's very uh, elastic. And we have tested the uh, developed electrodes. We tested the electrical, mechanical, and chemical properties. 
and uh, uh, the uh, the electrode that we have now has actually 266 percent uh, elongation which is uh, uh, considered to be uh, far more than what is required for such um, recordings now the other um, uh, project that our students are involved in this is actually the outcome of a master's uh, project uh, thesis uh, an intra oral camera for controlling assistive devices we know that interfacing, of course, may be due to or maybe through eye blinks or facial expressions like what we heard earlier from Abdullah could be um, uh, uh, AOGs or could be sip and, uh, and puff technologies. Uh, here we, we, we tried to use the tongue as a muscular organ, which is directly, as you know, connected to the brain via the, the, the cranial nerve. And this, the tongue provides uh, two advantages. Um, one is the, the movement of the tongue is usually unaffected by spina, spinal cord injuries. And it, it's, it's a very strong muscle, can work for, for, for many hours. And also it provides also some sort of, so, you know, it's, it's a socially uh, acceptable device because it's inside the, the, the mouse. This, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, technology was developed here at the university and uh, uh, the student was able to actually uh, use artificial intelligence for uh, uh, recognizing 11 uh, uh, main motions. These 11 motions, of course, were used um, to control and, you know, assistive devices. And here, of course, we are relying on controlling a robotic arm uh, just to, for demonstration. He also uh, managed to uh, use this uh, device for typing. You know, you can type with, um, with tongue motion. Another student worked with us on brain computer interface where we record the signals from the brain, uh, like EEG signals. And again, we use machine learning and, 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 uh, uh, and, and some mathematics to uh, control assistive devices. Focus was on only four motions, which are uh, extension, retraction, pronation, and supination. And with some uh, success, uh, we've noticed that the motion uh, imagination with flashing images produced better results than just uh, imagination. And our last uh, project, the last project that I would like to talk to you about today is the uh, uh, vigilance uh, 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 enhancement. Uh, well, actually, vigilance decrement measurement and vigilance enhancement. This is a and very important uh, Dr. Hassan, uh, project. Just one second. Uh, your slides are not moving. We are still seeing the EEG brain source localization slide. Oh. Oh, okay. Apologies. <laughs> yeah, because I think you're speaking uh, about the cognitive vigilance, but we are not. Oh, uh, okay. I, I kind of talked and uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Apologies yeah. for that. Yeah. This is the um, this is actually the uh, the device that I talked to you about the um, the 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 enteral, uh, oral camera that I talked to you about earlier on, and this is the um, eleven. Uh, 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 basically, we take the images and we process the images using uh, signal processing and machine learning to recognize the eleven motions that I mentioned to you earlier. On. I, I do apologize for this. And this is the uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, text writing, if you wish. And this this uh, the, the this slide here is for the brain computer interface that I mentioned. Also, we use here machine learning and artificial intelligence to recognize certain motions. Uh, of course, this is a, not an easy problem, and it's been going on for many years. Uh, but our focus here at the moment, just for, for main uh, uh, hand motions. And um, so for, for vigilance uh, enhancement, uh, the applications are many. I mean, uh, it could be airport security, could be uh, vehicle, you know, drivers um, who, who, who actually uh, lose vigilance after a long day driving, diagnostic medical uh, uh, images, 
air traffic, etc. And also, it can also be, we have not done that yet, but it can also uh, use with ADHD uh, cases. The challenge here is actually that vigilance drops, uh, vigilance uh, uh, level, if it drops to below a certain value, the cognitive uh, um, efficiency also drops and mistakes start to happen. On the, on the same, uh, on, on, the, on the other hand, if, if, if uh, 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 cognitive workload is high, we also lose vigilance and we also start to make mistakes. So, so the challenge for us is to find an optimum region of vigilance where your uh, uh, cognitive efficiency is maximum. And here I'm just showing you a couple of examples. Uh, the, the, like on the left, uh, the driver uh, texting and, and driving at the same time. This leads to overloading the brain and, 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 and making mistakes and maybe accidents. On the, on the right side, this is like highway, uh, lorry drivers drive for a very long time and then uh, their vigilance drops and that also may end up in, 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 in uh, uh, big uh, accidents. So we have developed uh, um, uh, several experiments in our laboratory here to investigate this important matter. And we focused on using alternative technologies for enhancing vigilance. And we noticed that one of the very interesting techniques, it was like using gaming and challenging the brain. So in other words, if somebody is in the, in the, in the security, uh, looking at screen and, and, and we observe that vigilance uh, is, is decreasing, we can always like play a game with this person and, and, and challenge the brain in order to enhance uh, vigilance. We have also used other senses like um, uh, uh, vision, uh, and tactile uh, uh, senses. Uh, this is like in a driving uh, environment here, if, if vigilance drops and if the cars become too close to each other, tactile uh, sensation may enhance uh, vigilance. And this is as shown uh, or proven by uh, measurements of the reaction time before and after um, uh, using this technique. At the moment, we are investigating using what's called um, the binaural beats, where we uh, stimulate the ears with different frequencies. Uh, this is supposed to be a promising technology as well for people who are, again, working for, for long hours. We hope that this technology may uh, or will uh, um, uh, enhance uh, vigilance. And our initial results uh, uh, show clearly that the reaction time with people who hear this binaural beats actually drops in comparison with the control subjects who are not exposed to these uh, binaural beats. And we have also used you know, uh, advanced techniques such as uh, brain connectivity uh, methods to investigate uh, the patterns uh, with or without binaural beats. I think, I mean, I mean, I thank the audience. And if any of the audience is interested in any of the technologies that we talked about or the research projects that I talked about, I'll be more than happy to discuss with them or, or him or her now or later. Uh, my email is with, uh, with Dr. Devika, so please contact me anytime. I'll be more than happy to collaborate. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. For a very very informative uh, presentation uh, let's open it up to the audience if there are any questions or comments uh, for dr hassan and the research that um, he has shared with us uh, dr hassan if you can leave your email in the chat box for anybody to get in touch with you um, that might help okay all right. So um, thank you, Dr. Hassan, for that thank very, you very interesting. Much. And you'll be, please stay in, on the panel so we can take some questions later. Okay. So over to the next uh, presenter, Dr. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Eid is our next presenter. Dr. Muhammad Eid has received his PhD in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Ottawa in Canada in 2010. 
He's currently an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering at the New York University Abu Dhabi. He has won several awards for academic and research distinctions, including Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada Award for Excellence and University of Ottawa Excellence Scholarship and Ontario Graduate Scholarship. Dr. Eid is the co-author of the book Haptics Technologies, Bringing Touch to Multimedia. This is an area of particular interest to Dr. Eid. He has been the technical chair of the Haptic Audiovisual Environment and Gaming Symposium for several years. He is the recipient of several Best Paper Awards and in several international conferences, and, and also of the prestigious ACM Multimedia 2009 Grand Challenge Most Entertaining Award for Hug Me, a synchronous haptic teleconferencing uh, uh, system. Here, uh, Dr. Eid will be sharing with us Kathib, a haptic based assistive technology to support handwriting. So over to you, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Eid. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, thank you very much also for inviting me to this wonderful event. I've been enjoying this very much and such an inspiring talk by Abdullah and all the speakers. Uh, my name is Mohammed Aid. I'm an assistant professor uh, of electrical and computer engineering at New York University in Abu Dhabi. I'm leading the Applied Interactive Multimedia Research Lab here in Abu Dhabi, where we are developing technologies for simulating touch um, uh, interaction with humans. And uh, today I would like to share one of the projects that we have uh, worked on for several years now. And this project is about developing um, force feedback, haptic feedback to support handwriting. And in particular, this generation of this technology we call Katib, which means in Arabic, writer. So this is a brief overview about what I'm going to talk about. So I'll start with a little bit of a background and a motivation for this work. Then I'll go briefly over the hardware and the software designs that we built. I also uh, want to spend a, a few minutes talking about a recent um, experiment that we conducted with the American Center of Psychiatry and Neurology here in Abu Dhabi with children with learning difficulties uh, that demonstrated the effectiveness of this approach. Finally, I'll wrap up with a conclusion and provide perspectives for future work. So as we all know, um, handwriting is a very complex skill that requires sensory, cognitive, motor, um, even memory and linguistic skills to um, acquire, and it usually takes several years to master. We know that approximately four to six percent of students have a form of written language learning difficulty. We also um, understand that those uh, handwriting difficulties could um, come in different forms like sensory, motor, or even integration. Um, also something which brought me to this uh, area is uh, that the sense of touch seems to play a crucial role in learning sensory motor skills, and of course, handwriting in particular in this case. So just to give you a little bit of background for what we've been working on before, uh, we came to Katib. So we developed this device, as you can see, there is a little video now that is playing. So it's basically a robotic arm that has a pen-like stylus, stylus as its end effector, where the, the learner would just hold the stylus and then the robotic arm will physically guide their hand onto a handwriting trajectory. And in this case, the uh, learner could learn not only through their visual information, but they also can learn through proprioception, which is uh, by, mo by motion. So we uh, built the system, we evaluated with adults uh, learning Arabic as second or third language, which was mainly uh, students from NYU Abu Dhabi. Then we collaborated with the Cranley Abu Dhabi School in Abu Dhabi here, where we conducted an experiment with 32 typical children, and we experimented this for uh, over nine weeks where we uh, compared um, a group where they used this system versus another group who used the uh, classical approach that the school was adopting. And we found that there was significant improvement 
in um, the group that used this particular technology. However, we found some limitations. And one of the key limitations that uh, a lot of the children complained about, and even the teachers, was this mechanical coupling between the robotic arm the, and the stylus. As you all know, the way we handwrite is we hold the stylus or the pen, we can move it freely. Different people have different grasping uh, preferences. Um, so for example, right-handed or left-handed people. So this device was kind of hard-coded for one particular type of users, right-handed or left-handed and also one particular grasping orientation. So this is why we wanted to simply get rid of this mechanical attachment. And what we did, we proposed this uh, platform called CATIB where we are trying to rely on using magnetic forces. And the way we did this is we uh, used a very strong permanent magnet where we placed it underneath the screen. And then we attached a little small magnet to the stylus, which is kind of embedded inside so you don't see it. And then we attach this permanent magnet that sits underneath the screen. We attached it to a two arms uh, parallel manipulator, which is a robotic device that can move this permanent magnet in 2D space. And then as the permanent magnet moves in 2D space, it kind of drags and pulls the stylus which goes on top of the screen to move along the same trajectory. So that way we can provide force feedback without having to have any mechanical attachment. And in this case, the learner can hold the stylus in however um, uh, orientation for their grasping preference, or there, there will be no visual occlusions because when you have a robotic arm covering the screen, then this also created some issues for the learners. Now, with that, I wanted to briefly explain what the hardware uh, that we developed looked like. So it's based on a Raspberry Pi 3B plus microprocessor with a touchscreen display. We're using two um, stepper motors to control this parallel manipulator that controls the magnet that goes underneath the screen to move into the space. We're using a stepper motor to control the magnet, to rotate the magnet, the permanent magnet 90 degrees so that we can turn on and off the magnetic field. And then we use the PID controller to control all of this. What I wanted to say about this hardware setup, which I think is very important here, is that all this setup will cost less than 1000 dirhams. And this is one of the design requirements that we've had early on so that hopefully this technology will be accessible to as many users as possible. Then we developed uh, graphical user interfaces where we have two interfaces, one for instructors where instructors can handwrite any kind of handwriting uh, task. They can save the task, they can send it to a, a learner, and then the learner can download this handwriting task and they can play it back. And in this case, by playing back, I mean they can play it back visually, as you see here on the screen with the, with the Arabic letter Ayn, or they can also play it back haptically by experiencing the force feedback as they are handwriting this particular letter. It can be a letter, it can be a shape, it can be a word, it can be any kind of handwriting task. Then we, we thought about what kind of physical guidance we would like to provide to users and how that could help uh, participants or learners. And we came across two different methods of physical guidance. The first one, we call it the proactive guidance. And in the proactive guidance method, um, the permanent magnet moves or leads the handwriting trajectory and the user would just grasp the stylus and just follow the movement. And in this case, they are learning by uh, following the movement. So that's one mode of learning. And then the other one is called retroactive uh, guidance. And in this case, we have the user freely moving the, hand, the stylus along the handwriting trajectory and the magnetic field is only activated when there is a significant deviation from the desired trajectory where the magnetic force will be applied to put back the stylus on the right trajectory. We also conducted experiments to compare these two, and we found that um, these two techniques would work with different kind of um, handwriting skills. 
And this is how the device looked like. If you see, there is a little video here that's playing on the um, lower right part of the screen. And this shows how the stylus is placed on top of the screen and it's, and then the magnet underneath the screen is capable of holding the stylus and then moving it along the handwriting trajectory. And we're showing the example of writing the letter I in, in this case. And I wanted to say that we did this only for the sake of visual uh, demonstration, but ideally we want the learner to hold the stylus and then they can actually feel the forces as they are constructing the handwriting trajectory. We also measured the accuracy of the playback or the ability to, um, for the stylus to follow the under uh, the permanent magnet that's underneath the screen. And we found that the error, the, the displacement between the two is less than three millimeters, which is the minimum requirement for uh, proper uh, playback for uh, handwriting trajectories in general. Next, I wanted to briefly talk about the uh, experiment that we conducted. Um, so this is a study that we conducted in collaboration with the American Center of, Psycho of Psychology, Psychiatry and Neurology in Abu Dhabi, where we recruited 22 children, four to nine years old, with mild intellectual difficulties and mild fine motor control difficulties. We divided them into two groups, one control group where they used the classical techniques, um, uh, therapeutic techniques for uh, improving their handwriting skills. And then the other 11 uh, children were our experimental group where they were using our system. So they came to the uh, center once a week where they conducted two um, experimental sessions. This study was approved by, the, by both RB committees at NYU Abu Dhabi and at the American Center of Psychiatry and Neurology. We also recruited two uh, occupational therapist to evaluate the handwriting skills by the end of the experiment for all the uh, uh, children. So what we did, we used uh, 32 handwriting tasks, as you see here in the table on the right hand side, and we divided those handwriting tasks as in terms of their visual familiarity or haptic difficulty. So we have tasks that are visually familiar or unfamiliar, or they're haptically uh, uh, low, have low uh, difficulty, medium difficulty, or high difficulty, which means they're visually familiar, but they could be difficult to handwrite. So we did this study over nine weeks, and then we used these two groups, and then we applied statistical analysis to compare uh, their performance. What we found was interesting. So for those tasks that are visually familiar, and haptically easy, for example, the letter I or a simple shape of it, writing a triangle, things like that, we found that the two techniques kind of performed equivalently. So this, the children were improving their skills kind of with no significant differences between these two approaches. Then we tried for the other, uh, we tested the uh, visually familiar but haptically medium difficulty levels. And we found that the classical methods that the center used outperformed our system. But what was really interesting is to look at the third class of uh, handwriting tasks where the task was visually familiar but was haptically hard. For example, the arrow was really easy for uh, children to recognize visually, but was very challenging for them to handwrite. And likewise, for example, for the star, um, they were easily recognizing it visually, but was really haptically difficult for them to handwrite. We found that in this kind of tasks that our system performed significantly better than what they had. And finally, if the task was completely unfamiliar and haptically very challenging. Both of techniques did not perform very well because that was kind of too hard for uh, children to, uh, to improve. So with that, I want to wrap up uh, this. And um, one thing we are looking forward to uh, work, do is to develop other techniques for haptic guidance. For example, we want to incorporate little vibrations during the handwriting, and I think that could help with attention. We wanted also to experiment with other kinds of learning difficulties, such as attention deficits, uh, dysgraphia, processing deficits, and so on. We also wanted, and I think this has a great potential as a, uh, as a rehab 
uh, technique for post-stroke patients. And finally, with, with all the encouragement that we got uh, from, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with all the encouragements that we got today, uh, that I think we, we are planning to have a startup uh, hopefully soon. So with that, I want to acknowledge first New York University Abu Dhabi for supporting this. I also wanted to acknowledge that this research was funded by uh, the Department of Education and Knowledge in uh, UAE. And finally, the American Center of Psychiatry and Neurology for collaborating with us on this project. So with that, I would like to thank you all and I would, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed, for that uh, wonderful, crisp presentation. Let me check if there are any questions. Uh, does the audience have any questions for Dr. Eid? Um, there's a question um, for your presentation. I can't see any right now. So, um, Dr. Eid, if you could leave your email in the chat box. Uh, okay. So there's a question right now, how a person will do to sign? Um, yeah. Yes, so this technology is used to do any kind of handwriting. And in one of the setups that we can, we can use it for, for learning hand, uh, handwriting and in general, and maybe a writing signature in particular, this is, uh, for example, you could record your signature and then we could play it back and we could, uh, let's say, learn this handwriting, or we could actually use the tele sign or tele signature uh, uh, mechanism where you can sign this at a distance. So I'm not sure what sign uh, means here, how a person will do to sign. You mean, if you mean signing on a, like on an electric screen, like signature, then yes, I mean, this is a touch screen that we can measure the forces, we can measure the position, we can all measure this information and, and surely you can use it for, for signing, but it's not developed for this purpose. It's developed for providing force feedback to improve handwriting skills acquisition. Um, there's another question, Dr. Eid. Uh, can you tell us what age group this haptic is used for? Can it be used for kindergarten students? Yes, this is an excellent question. So in, earlier in this presentation, I mentioned that for the children with learning difficulties, uh, we used four to nine years old. This was the age group that we targeted. For typical children with the Cranley Abu Dhabi school, we used a group four to six year old. So we used FS1 and we used year two. Okay. So... Um... Thank you, Dr. Reed, um, for a wonderful presentation. So um, for the last presentation in the webinar, uh, we have Dr. Ayman Elbaz, who's joining us from Louisville, Kentucky, and who's been patiently waiting. Dr. Ayman is a professor, university scholar, and chair of the bioengineering department at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. He has received his doctoral degree in electrical engineering from the University of Louisville in 2006. In 2009, Dr. Elbaz was named as a Coulter Fellow for his contribution to the field of biomedical translational research. Dr. Elbaz has 15 years of hands-on experience in the fields of bioimaging, modeling, non-invasive computer-assisted diagnostic systems. He has co-authored more than 450 technical articles, authored and co-authored, 105 journal articles, 15 books, 50 book chapters and 175 refereed conference papers and 15 US patents. Today, Dr. Elbas will be sharing with us information on diagnostics of autism and promising treatment technologies. Over to you, Dr. Ayman Elbas. Thank you for joining us. And first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for inviting me for, to participate in this panel. A special thank, a thanks for Dr. Said who recommended me to share the work at my lab with uh, uh, with your group. So mainly, uh, the main focus of my lab is uh, application of machine learning in uh, uh, in medicine. And but today I will uh, so I will present one of main project in the lab that we started in two thousand five with collaboration with Dr. Casanova, 
uh, he's the director of autism center at uh, South Carolina. And Dr. Bardes, uh, right now, he's the director of autism center at uh, uh, University of Louisville. And so what I present is, again, around is 15 years of work. I started when I was a PhD student, and after I graduated, my students start to continue this work. Recently, this is technology has been licensed by Autism Diagnostic Technology, which is located in New York. So, so if someone interested, my lab is focused in many areas. One of them in oncology, second one is brain disorder, uh, and the third one is spinal cord injury. In uh, brain disorder, we are working in autism, dyslexia, and Alzheimer. So today we're gonna present one of our technology in the in the autism. And uh, in 2005, even I didn't know what is autism. So when my clinical collaborator came to the lab and started to talk about autism, I asked him what is autism. So he started to introduce or uh, discussed with me is autism is a mental condition present in early childhood. And usually the children has a problem in, uh, in communication and the creating the friend. And also they have some problem in using the language. So I now I started to understand what is autism, but since we are interested to develop a technology, we, ha we have to see if this is technology significant or not. Uh, how many people need this technology? This is some of the answer. And uh, in one work with US, we have uh, this is program that support uh, uh, translational research from NIH, from NSF, and from Department of Defense. And usually you have to make some, to give some analysis to represent uh, what will be the market size. So when Dr. Kazanova come to the, our lab, he started to show the statistics. 5% of the children at high risk for developing autism. Then he started to tell us, this is the most recent uh, study and I can tell you, this is number start when I started is one out of 200. Uh, then become one out of 100. Then come one out of six, six. So most recent number come from CDC is one out of 54 children in the United States has autism. So this is mean it is a very big problem. And especially with the, with the current technology. So given this, we start to see, okay, if this is a big problem, how much you is a health insurance company in US to spend on this? So to see the, 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 uh, the money that the health insurance is paying to, to diagnose and to treat autism, in 2006, is around $40 billion. In 2012, $120 billion. 2018, $360 billion. So you see that increasing the cost because there is many children born develop autism. And uh, from in 2012, around $35 billion they are spent on diagnosis. So this is to show you the size of the problem. Then uh, this is from market size. So what is from a, a clinical point of view? A clinical point of view, when Dr. Kazanova and Dr. Barnes, our clinical collaborator was with us, they told us the main problem with autism, it is a spectrum. And this is spectrum is not narrow. It is a very wide spectrum. It start from mild development, which is start with speech delay, until we reach it to autism or severe autism. Which is a, which they have physical symptoms like sleepness, epilepsy, and are a lot of problem in communication. So this is biggest spectrum. Make accurate diagnosis of it is subjective. So at this time we started to see what will be the research question if we need to develop a technology. So right now this is what the research technology questions that we bought can big data help in determining the status of patient on the autism spectrum. Also, the second research question, can we detect it early? And when we mean early, we mean in the first year of uh, after born. Third, can we get a matrix or objective matrix to help us diagnosis 
all this is question we discuss it in the table when we start so we started this is project as i told you in 2005 after we we find a good collaborator we find the data and we started to say this will be the big data so this is the current technology behavior report which you call addis report this is the current standard and this is usually the doctor start to able to generate this uh, report around uh, roughly around three years from board so and our medical doctor mentions that no if we able to diagnose autism early in the first year at this stage it will help in uh, the growth help in the growth of uh, uh, the, at this time the brain of the child is at a, you can delay how how it develops so we can change the development of the brain but after three years it will be difficult and we have some experiment to say the people who who diagnosed early we help them to reach iq 60 which is completely independent but if we diagnose the late usually we reach around 40 or 45 which is a judge child still needs support from his or her parent so this is the imaging marker. This is how we start. So the main problem with ADIS robots are subjective and usually depend on uh, the experience of the doctor. So this this why NIH when use it as a gold standard. They have to get five robots from five dependent experts. And if they are matched, they can consider this correct diagnosis. If they didn't, if they, if they didn't match, they uh, discard this diagnosis. So imaging marker, we talk about structure MRI, structure MRI, function MRI, diffusion tensor MRI, and genome. Then we go to the last thing, which is uh, family history. So when we started here, this is how we started to use artificial intelligence and in deep learning. We see right now we use these three modalities to make diagnosis. And when we make diagnosis, this is, this is the advantage of artificial intelligence that we didn't show, we didn't make only what is called the binary diagnosis, autistic or not autistic. This is, no, what is the most important is we have to show the abnormal area and we have to locate where this is subject in the spectrum. Why? Because this is will help in personalized medicine. And when we got funding from NIH, this is what as they told us first, yes, we show us uh, a proof of concept data that you can make diagnosis, autistic versus control. Second, when we able to get this, they asked us now we need personalized diagnosis. We need to show the abnormal area because this is will help us in the treatment. And this is what came later. So when we put this is uh, the, every component in the in the system has meaning and this is meaning must come from our clinical collaborator so if someone google inter internet and he just write big brain the big brain come is, is the autistic brain what this mean the size of the brain of autistic is greater or bigger than the normal this is why how we can capture this by structure mri which captures the anatomy then uh, there is a problem in uh, coherence between the left hemisphere and right hemisphere and the connectivity. So how we can capture this is by function MRI in the coherence. Third is there is some problem in the connectivity, how the neuron developed from the cortex to deep structure. We can capture this by DTR. So when we use the concept of big data, we didn't, it is, doesn't make sense to collect whatever is available and devoted no you have to collect what is makes sense. So this is the three component approved by NIH that they can play a major role in early diagnosis of autism. And based on this, we start to develop our approaches for, to, for using the structure MRI. And one of the novelty here is since, yes, we know the, the bigger brain is autistic, but there is another parameter that did play a role in the size of the brain one of them is the sex is this is female brain or male brain race is this is from africa from asia from uh, america or europe so this is another uh, this is another. 
in addition to the preprocessing. So what we did in our lab, and we have a couple of patents on this, and instead of using a volumetric measure, we use shape, a shape or morphology metrics. And the, because this will be less sensitive to the sex, less sensitive to the age, less sensitive to the preprocessing. Second component is for, we use it as fMRI because this is what we say for autistic subjects, uh, they are overconnected. This is what we, our hypothesis. But for uh, all underconnected, under connected, over connected in the same hemisphere, under connected in the across hemisphere. But for normal, they are perfect connected. So, uh, second one for DTI, as I told you, this is, and this is uh, if, if someone see autistic children, if it, even if it's severe, sometimes they touch a hot surface or, and they didn't remove their uh, hand and their skin got burned. This is because this is one of the main problems that uh, the signal didn't propagate well from the cortex to the deep structure to help the brain to take a decision to remove your hand from this hot surface. And so this is this has come from this hypothesis that in autistic subject, uh, the neuron it take away like a, sp a sphere or circle. So in sphere or circle, you have one di one radius. So the si the signal didn't propagate or there is no direction. But in normal developed brain, we find that the the neuron looks like ellipse when you have a major diameter and you have minor diameter. So is the signal can propagate through the major diameter. So based on this, we started to, we got the data from NIH and we started to test our approach. And this is what is the novel here. This is what I wanna tell you about uh, uh, the, the, the most important. So we make global diagnosis. This is uh, autistic or not autistic. Based on structure MRI, we got 92%. FMRI, we got 95%. DTI give us 91% overall accuracy 97. This is what's called binary decision, autistic versus not autistic. But what is new in this is technology is even if it is autistic, we have to show where is the abnormal area in the brain. If it is red, show it is, this is very close to autistic. If it is orange, it is in, in mild. So we have a neuro, uh, uh, Dr. Barnes was the director of autism center, his nephrologist. He, so he 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 got he did use this as uh, abnormal area and determine which neuro circuits is has malfunction. Is this is neuro circuit related to the behavior, related to speech, related to memory, related to emotion, and based on this we can decide what type of treatment. And even we can say even this is control subject, we have some area on them match with autism. So also this can give explanation if some if we see some abnormal behavior from a control subject, this is technology even can give us understanding of what. After this, we now, as Dr. Said mentioned, can we uh, detect this is uh, disability at early stage? And if we detect at early stage, can we stop it? And this is exactly what we start to do. And the NIH start to collect this genome data from family who has autism history. And we start to find the, the, the markers that we got from structural MRI, the markers that we got from function MRI, the marker we got it from DTI, it start we, we correlated with uh, the genome sequence that we have. And the good news, we find that some genome data, and yes, for sure, you, when you make a correlation, you can get, but the good news that when we, we make this correlation, the genome that we detected, it is reported in the literature that is related to neurodegeneration. And this is support our finding. So this is uh, what we did over the last 15 years. And this, uh, this is one part of my lab. Second part of my lab, I start to say, okay, if someone has a problem in behavior, how we can, it, it can help in the treatment. This is what we do it. So. That the first part of the technology now it help us to locate where the subject it is in the spectrum. So when we get this information, we get it and we find the area and locate it where it's in the spectrum. So it's the first part. 
Second part, we need to start the treatment. One of the projects that we did in the lab is using robotics. And this is what the people or the doctor start to, to see that the autistic subject started to interact with robotic more than human. And one of the explanation to this because the robotic doesn't have a lot of details because this is exactly, this is one thing that if you say to his autistic subject, he saw female like female. He didn't, he can't dis discriminate between male and female. He can't discriminate between cat and dog. He says this is moving four legs and this is move or walking four legs. So this is maybe, uh, the, this is the main uh, reason or motivation that the autistic subject start to interact with robotic more than human. So we, st this, we started to make this experiment and we find in our lab that, yes, when we start this experiment, that the autistic children start to interact with the robot and the play. So we start now, and the good news, this is robotic that right now we have inexpensive robot. You can buy $200 or $300, dollar, you can buy a robot. So the, the family can buy this robot and they can start to program it and they start to use it in the house to interact with children. And we, this is what we do every week. We make the robot to work with the student, with, work with the children, and for example, to learn them one or two words. After we learn them some words, we start to use the robot to learn them how to pronounce a complete sentence, like "How are you?" Say "Good morning." So this is what. Then after say "Good morning," "How are you?" "What's up today?" So this is what we started to do with these children, and really we find a very good result. And this is some real experiment from the autism center that here in Louisville, and we have different robots. And right now, the last thing we need now, even the robot to be start more interactive by laughing, by dancing, by making some facial expression. This is the current state of the project. So last thing, this is also, I start to work and this is with uh, 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 in 2006 is usually we have the autistic subject as hypertension. And uh, when we see this is from the diagnosis that we did using fMRI, if we find some hypertension activity, we started to use TMS. TMS is a low frequency magnetic field. We bought it in the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And this is the protocol that we use it. So the low frequency it is from half to one hertz and we use from 150 to 100 volts per day. We make one or two sessions per week. And uh, after we did eight sessions, so we have two program uh, or two way of treatment. Some children go for eight sessions and the other go for 18 sessions. And we got, this is their high bar, this is the EEG signal. We measure the gamma evoked and induced. So what is called early gamma and late gamma. And this is, if you see the blue is before treatment and the red after treatment. So the gamma again, when the signal is high, this means sure that the children is hyperactive. So when it's go down, this is improve uh, their uh, hypertension activities. And this is, this is when we did it, you see here, we draw their hypertension activity before and after. And this is one of the big projects that funded by NIH and the current research question, when we make eight session or 18 session, is, this is, can be permanent treatment or temporary. Temporary mean we have to repeat it after three months or six months or one year. This is another research question that uh, my lab with autism center right now is working on it. And this is what, this is what we try to do is uh, try to follow up with the uh, children who got the treatment to see if their hypertension activity stays the same, there is no significant change, or there's some changes happen after six or one year from the treatment. Again, that's all, and I just need to thank all of you, and also for sure, I am not the one who did all this work. We have a big team here behind uh, uh, this work. We have uh, in the lab more than 50, 50, uh, 
uh, what is called researcher, most of them from Arab world, some of them from United Arab Emirates, most of them from Egypt, and uh, some from India. So again, a lot of big students, around more than six postdoctor, and again, uh, all of them are outstanding, and I just present their good work. And thank you, and I am ready for a question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ryman, for that excellent presentation. Uh, you already have a question in the chat box. Um, this one comes from Nepal. Is it possible to cure Down syndrome through child diagnostics and treatment? Again, I, I can't say yes, I can't say no, because this is, we didn't start. So far, we use this as technology in two disorders, autism and dyslexia. And it worked fine both, both, for both of them. But as you know that, because the brain is very complex. So in order to do this, is we have to run experiment and start to measure the outcome. But I, it, it will be difficult. But right now, I can what I can say, this is technology work fine for two brain disorder autism and dyslexia. Uh, there's another question. Uh, what's the relationship between autism and seizures? Uh, again, this is, again, it is, a, uh, if we talk about severe autism, you will find there is some, something correlated to each other. But for early, what is called, if we talk about the border between control and the autistic, no, there is no relation. But in severe autism, yes, some children have seizures. Yes. And this is what we try to help by TMS, by the way. When we do the, use the TMS, it will reduce the risk for and reduce the hyper. It improves the connectivity and improve, uh, reduce the, the occurrence of seizures. Okay. Um, there's a question from uh, Dr. Eid. Have you thought of using virtual reality instead of physical robots? Yes, yeah, this is, uh, uh, we try to use it, yes. This is another project in my lab, but we didn't do it, to, I didn't present it today. We are to using uh, virtual reality, uh, uh, but also using robots, but, but using robots in the virtual reality. So we have the glass and we, we, because again, there is a reason behind using the robot. The autistic subject didn't like to see one with a lot of details, as I told yeah. you. They like to say what is called global feature, not local or the delta feature. So yes, we currently we try to use robot with uh, virtual reality in the lab, but right now uh, we are in the way to evaluate is this is good similar to robot or gives the same result much better less. So we are in the evaluation process, but right now yes, and even we try use virtual reality in two project in. In autism and also for the people who has spinal cord injury. Okay. Okay. Uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Um, any more questions for Dr. Ayman or any other uh, presenters today? Uh, there is one question from. Uh, I think yeah, most of the questions have been answered. So. Um, um, there are no more questions coming up. No more comments. So uh, before we leave, and as we draw close uh, to this, uh, towards the end of this uh, webinar, um, I'd like to thank all our esteemed panelists, starting with Madam Wafa Suleiman, uh, Ms. Wafa Hamad bin Suleiman, um, Abdullah, Dr. Saeed, Dr. Hassan, Dr. Muhammad Eid, and Dr. Ayman for your uh, wonderful sharing of your professional expertise, your vast knowledge, your research, and for taking all the questions and um, ensuring that the presentations were very enriching for our audience. Thank you all so much. Before we leave, uh, I'll hand over um, to uh, my colleague, Stephen, who will start the uh, feedback survey. So uh, I think he's already posted the feedback link in the chat box. If every one of you can look at the feedback of the webinar and fill it up and share with us your comments, your feedback, and what you think about the presentations. If you wish to get to know more about any of the researchers or their work. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us from wherever you are. And thank you all to our esteemed panelists for sharing your valuable time and your expertise. 
um, and I think many of the audience members would like the uh, emails of our panelists. So if they could post their email, some of you have already posted. Um, and uh, we will share the recording of the webinar today. So um, if we can have all the panelists on the screen, Dr. Iman, if you could uh, shop, stop sharing your slide, please. Okay, sure. Still sharing or cast? It's still sharing, yes. Okay. Stop now or we still? Um, we can still see your screen. Yes. So um, we request all the members in the audience to please fill up the feedback questionnaire. And um, to with this, we draw to a close this afternoon's uh, webinar. Uh, if any of the panelists want to share their uh, feedback, comments, or observations, we would welcome that. Dr. Saeed? You're muted, Dr. Saeed. Uh, thank you, uh, Deepka, for arranging this event. I think it's wonderful uh, to have such uh, uh, distinguished and esteemed panelists joining from, uh, from UAE and the US. Um, I would like to thank them all from Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Hassan, uh, Dr. Ayman, yourself for moderating this, uh, this panel. It's been really a wonderful. And I think this shows the really the capability, you know, that we have here in the UAE in terms of conducting, uh, you know, R&D in such an area where it really touches, uh, you know, uh, our 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 human, uh, our, our human nature, and hopefully that we will see more of this research coming in the future, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Said. Abdullah, would you like to share uh, your thoughts? Mm -hmm. um, if Abdullah can come on screen. Uh, until we wait for uh, Abdullah, Dr. Hassan. Yes, I just wanted to say thank you very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure um, participating in this uh, important meeting. Uh, it was also a pleasure listening to my uh, colleagues, uh, Mohammed, Saeed, and Ayman. And uh, also, maybe this is a nice opportunity for uh, collaboration, you know, if yeah. there is a a project that uh, uh, you know that is of interest to the audience as well. Uh, it would be really great to uh, if they can communicate with us directly. We're open to collaboration. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Doctor Hassan. Thank you for those words, uh, Abdullah. You would like to say something? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello, sorry, but uh, I opened the microphone by mistake. Uh, uh, thank you to all uh, for sharing this uh, uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, and I hope we can uh, cooperate together uh, to share our experience to support uh, people with uh, disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Dr. Reed, uh, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, first of all, to you for organizing this and bringing this event together. I also would like to echo what Dr. Saeed and Dr. Hassan said about that this is a really great uh, thread where we all came together to exchange ideas. And, and I got two, three different research ideas now that I'm going home. I kind of have my homework now and I definitely, I will be looking forward to maybe collaborating with, um, with the other speakers who I just realized how, how, how we can materialize some of these research ideas and uh, particularly Dr. Saeed uh, reference to startups. And, yeah. and I think I have some ideas in my research lab that I wanted to commercialize. I never found the time and maybe I couldn't find resources. And there you go. I, I just learned from Dr. Saeed about all these 
fantastic resources that we have in UAE. And I would love to capitalize and, and use some of these resources. Thank you all again for, for this uh, wonderful event. Thank you. Dr. Ayman, any thoughts from you? Yes, again, usual, I like this idea of webinar because uh, 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 again, we share the information, we share the two book of research uh, in the best. Uh, usual, I visit United Arab Emirates for one or two times per year because I have uh, collaboration in Abu Dhabi University, in Dubai University, Khalifa University. But this year, I was not able to travel because of the COVID. Finally, I got the vaccine. But maybe like in a couple of months, we, I can resume again my trip to United Arab Emirates. But during the last year, I participated in two, two or three webinars and they gave me opportunity to more about uh, a lot of research like Dr. Hassan, what he's doing in American University, Dr. Saeed, I, I honor to know him and he's, he's the one who recommended me for this panel. And you start to see that uh, a lot of activity right now in United Arab Emirates, and I hope the rest of all Arab country will have the same activity like what I see right now uh, in United Arab Emirates. Really, uh, I am so happy that I participated in this. Dr. Ayman, have you, Dr. Ayman, have you, I don't think you visited us yet. Have you, have you visited us? No, not yet. No, no, not. I just visited Dubai University two or three okay. times because Dr. Isa is one of my best friends. Now, now, now after <laughs> being vaccinated, now you can come and visit us. <laughs> I know Dr. Isa Bistaki and he visited us in the uh, in University of Louisville. Uh, I hope, I, I know now Dr. Saeed is belong work at Dubai University. So next time when I visit Dubai, I love to see her face to face. And for yeah. sure, I like to come to American University in Sharjah and to, to do it. But you for are sure, welcome anytime, Dr. Ayman. You are welcome anytime to visit. Yes. I visit the University of Khalifa like three or four times, even before they change the name, because uh, uh, I think in last year or year before they changed the name of Khalifa University to be like Khalifa Technology. And the, the University of Abu Dhabi, I visit like every year, I visit one or two times. Right now, we are working with Dubai with collaboration, work with Fujira, And also, I give a seminar in Ajman University. Yes, I remember I give uh, one or two seminars. But during the last year, I love this activity that I see from United Arab Emirates because I participated in three or four webinars. And I love it because it gives me the opportunity to know good people like you. So this is, I am so happy to, know, to do that. So um, on behalf of the al -Nur Rehabilitation and Welfare Association for Persons of Determination, I'd like to thank all of you for coming uh, this afternoon and participating in this webinar. It's one of the objectives of the association where we seek to bring together researchers and experts in various areas to enhance our knowledge base and to bring about collaboration for the advancement of the lives of people of determination. So this webinar is a perfect opportunity for us to come together for various innovation projects, technology driven projects, so that we can all work together for um, uh, you know, improving the quality of life of people of determination. So at Al Noor, we welcome opportunities for collaboration and we look forward to building our associations with all of you as experts uh, within the area of technology. So thank you all once again, and thank you to the wonderful audience for being so engaged and participative during this webinar. So uh, we look forward to hosting you during the next month's webinar, which is um, in the month of April. So until then, here's wishing all of you good health, stay safe thank and stay healthy. And have a good day. Have a good afternoon. Thank you all so much. This brings us to a close. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Dr. Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Dr. Depika, may I just suggest also sure, that, please. Please. you know, Al Noor, uh, if yes. you can also propose some uh, project, because some projects yes. are like more important than other projects sure. in, your, in your perspective. Yes. So it would be really interesting if you yes. uh, uh, make like a small document, couple of pages sure. with focus on the, uh, on, the, yes. on the projects that you find most urgent right. and more most important Absolutely. this would help uh, academicians to yes. to be more selective yeah in fact we would like to take this entire endeavor of this webinar forward and i'd like to actually also comment on the idea that dr said proposed in his last slide 
for yeah. R and D, the research and development in the area of uh, assistive technology, right. uh, and how uh, we can all work together to establish an institution of excellence in this area, because that's a real yeah. need for Great the idea. UAE. And uh, we have a whole lot of students with us with a range of disabilities, and we can really work together to find solutions for them. them also, yes. the idea of startups and the idea of haptics uh, uh, for handwriting. We have a whole lot of professionals with us. So this is a perfect platform to take it forward. So really, it's thank you all it's so much for sharing your expertise and your insights. And we do look forward to collaboration in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye, everyone. Have thank a good you. afternoon, all of you. Thank you so bye -bye, much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. See you. Thank you.